So Tanya, you and I have been friends for a long time, and you're involved in a ministry that deals in the area of dental work. You've got a free dental clinic that you run in Mechanicsville, Virginia, outside of the Richmond area. And people can come there for anything and everything, right? Um, everything but root canals and cosmetics. So, you, but you actually do dentures, you do, we do. teeth extractions, fillings, yes. and this is people who don't have the money to have it done. Yeah, no way they could have it done. No way they could have it done. Mm -hmm. There's no government programs, anything like that, that really take care of that unless you're under 18 and pregnant. So this is all free? It's all free. Free. Now, you told me a story about a young woman that just warmed your heart. We had a young woman come in um, at first. When she first came in, uh, we could clearly see that she was just in there for pain medication. And so we explained to her that we just, you know, didn't do that. And uh, a week or so later, I got a phone call from the local hospital. And um, she was there pain seeking. And for some reason, she, she gave our name to give credibility because she was still having a lot of oral pain, um, swelling, that kind of thing. And so I, I told them no, that um, I wouldn't give an approval on giving her anything for pain. Her excuse was is that we're not open until t Tuesdays and Thursday nights, so um, she would need to get you know pain medication. So this this clinic's open only two days. Two days a week, two evenings a week, all volunteer based, including all the doctors, any oral surgeons that step in and say that they'll take care of something, um, all the technicians and hygienists, all the staff, everybody's volunteer. And you even got our our dear Italian. Yes. Man who local restaurant. Local restaurant yeah, provides food for free. For free. Every Tuesday night? Every Thursday too? No, not on Thursday. Thursday is a very quick night and you're casting molds of people's mouths to do dentures. And so no food there. Uh, but it's it's a quicker evening. We'll see about six or seven patients and we we have five chairs. So we can get all those people in chairs, so there's no need to have food. Uh, Tuesday night's a, a longer evening. Sometimes we're there to about midnight. Wow. And, um, but we try to get in as many as we can. So So this woman came back to you, right? She did. Um, she was, you know, quite abrupt. And sometimes you'll have to deal with people that feel entitled. And so um, I let her know that, listen, we're just a small organization that tap on people's doors, uh, business people, and ask for donations to run the clinic. Uh, to buy the Novocaine and um, resin for the teeth and stuff like that. But when they find out you have no overhead because everybody comes uh, voluntarily, um, you're apt to get more donations. And so I just explained that to her. And um, I said, you know, we, we can't do the pain stuff because once you start doing that, you, you, know, you lose your clinic right. with people that are needing uh, pain medication. But... Um, I told her we wanted to help, and she, you know, just felt, um, you know, putting it back on us. And I just kept on working with her. And what, what were her teeth like? Um, she had been a meth mouth, and so um, explain a meth mouth. Uh, meth mouth is when they've um, done so many drugs that the teeth have decayed so much that some of them look pointed. It's it's really frightening uh, to look at. And she had been hospitalized several times. I finally got a letter from her cardiologist asking, you know, is there any way that we can extract the teeth? Um, she had had um, a couple of heart attacks. and um, How old is this woman? Uh, young. She's about 35. A couple and, of heart attacks at 35. Yeah, because of the, the drugs. And so um, when I went to go do paperwork on her, I thought, I'll just set up a private meeting with her. And when we were going through her paperwork, there was just a lot of holes in it. So I called her social worker. And I said, she doesn't seem to be able to, to answer a lot of these questions. And I feel compelled um, to really help her get out of this you know, pain that she's in. And I'm going to need some help. And so he kind of broke every rule and told me exactly what was going on. And... Um, and she was a prostitute uh, just north of our uh, little community here. And, um, you know, gets beat up a lot. And he said, if you can help her, I'll, you know, I'll help you get whatever information you need. And um, 
we, um, her mouth was in such bad shape, we really couldn't do it in-house. We were gonna have to um, go outside of the clinic to have it surgically done. So I got the medical college here in town to help me with that and uh, they did them in quadrants. That's, you know, uh, four appointments. And um, by the end of that, I had had an opportunity uh, to talk to her about the Lord so much that um, at one point she did have heart failure again. And I got a phone call from the hospital. I raced to the hospital to her bedside and um, she was hooked up with every piece of machinery I just couldn't um, believe, and she'd been there for a couple of days before she came to and was lucid enough uh, to have somebody call me, and uh, I was labeled her next of kin. Wow. And uh, she woke up when I got in there, and I woke her up and knelt down by her bed, didn't know if she was going to make it or not, and um, I just told her I was there, I was going to be praying for her. And uh, she said, I only have one thing to tell you. I've got my faith back. Wow. And that's all she really could get out at that time. But I knew then, I said, the Lord's got to work here. He's, he, he's going to finish this. And, um, and he did. Within a couple of months, she was back on her feet, uh, back in the clinic. And, um, but we did fit her with dentures. She became, all of a sudden, tell, she had had... Tell, so you told me the story already, so I want to catch one of the, what I felt was a key point. Okay. She gets her dentures. Yes. The doctor, the dentist puts the mirror in front of her face. I think a mirror or... Yeah, it was a mirror and she, she just couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it was her. She'd never really had pretty teeth to start with. And then, you know, the past five or six years of all the breaking and cracking of her teeth, but she was in shock. And the whole morning taking her, we did a one day denture thing with her. And the whole morning going over there, she kept on, I, when I get these teeth in here, I'm gonna be having myself a nice meal. Talk, 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 talk. <laughs> but when she came out of the room with teeth and I looked at her and called her by name. And I said, are, are they in there? And when she opened, just her lips ever so I could see it there and she looked beautiful. No more was her face scrunched up tiny. It was elongated and um, I just started crying. I said, she just looks so beautiful. And she said, even the doctor talked. And she started crying. And these women are pretty harsh women. So the Never doctor had the doctor had the doctor had told her, you're beautiful. And so we got out into the car and she took down the sun visor to look, at, and she just couldn't believe what she was seeing. And um, I just, I, I couldn't even drive. We just had to sit there in the parking lot for a good while and cry. You just look incredible. You just look incredible. And uh, she said, well, I, I, I just, she couldn't even talk. So it was a 30-minute drive back across town to even get her back to the hotel. She just didn't have a word to say. But every once in a while, she would take that sun visor down. And all morning, she had said, we're going to go in, and I'm going to knock on every door in that hotel and show everybody my teeth. But when we got there, um, she just wanted to go straight to her room, and she didn't want to knock on anybody's door. And why was that? You later found out, didn't you? I, you know, I really felt like you know, that they had told her what she needs to do in order to be able to get her... Um, formation of words and to be able to enunciate things that she needs to sit in front of a mirror for a couple of weeks and read as much as she can but and looking at herself and that will help her um, adjust to the dentures really really quickly but I felt she had never been beautiful before and the shock of it she just couldn't and I think she just wanted to go and be alone and just look in the mirror and um you think, well, you're, you're donating all your time and energy uh, to get these patients in. It takes about three hours worth of paperwork um, to get a patient in a dental chair, in, in any charity. And that's a stat that's all over the United States. It's a lot of paperwork and um, a lot of things that, you know, we require uh, to know about people before we put them in a chair, in a charity. But anyway... Um, you know, it's, it's nothing. 
the work is, is absolutely nothing compared to what, what you get in return. And you don't do it for that, but it's just the, the greatest joy is being able to, to minister like that and give, give people a new lease on life. Um, one of our criteria in our denture program is um, for employment. People can't, can't get a job when they have missing front teeth. Mm. You can't wait tables. Uh, you can't get a job anywhere. Wow. And so, um, you know, one of the criteria, we, we can't open it up to everybody. Uh, we wouldn't be able to afford to um, get the manpower to do all of that. But um, so part of the criteria, uh, because most of the people that we are dealing with are unemployed or underemployed or whatever, but when it comes to that denture program, um, you know, it's it's basically set up for people that have missing front teeth or missing teeth altogether, and they can't even get a job. Hmm. So there's a lot of... So reasons. you've had story after story after story, person after oh, person yeah. after person whose lives you've completely changed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, people come in with the simplest request, you know, um, and then things are turned around uh, completely. Mm -hmm. And you had said something to me, and that's the whole reason I've got you in here, mm -hmm. that when you look at your Monday through your Sunday, oh, yeah. or Sunday to Saturday, however you phrase your week, right. your highlight is? Tuesday nights. Tuesday, Tuesday nights. nights. Serving mm -hmm. others. Serving others. That's, that's the whole enchilada. Even when we take a week off for Christmas, there's a longing wow. to be back in there. And uh, we'll take off um, this week, this coming Tuesday. Most of our doctors will be in Florida on uh, spring break with their families. And so we go ahead and cancel uh, the week after Easter. But uh, there'll be a longing. So. And your husband, what yes. does he do as they come in? The men who've got um, their shoes on. Yes, if they have leather shoes on, they're going to get their shoes shined. And um, we have like a little lag time, especially at the beginning of the evening. My husband sterilizes uh, the instruments that mm -hmm. the doctors use. So, you know, when we first open up and it's a little bit crowded in there, um, he'll go in and spit out anybody that's got on a leather shoe. And he'll shine shoes for them. And what do they say? A lot of times they'll, oh, no, 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 the, these are old shoes. There's, you know, oh, please, please, you do not have to get, I couldn't have anybody shining my shoes. And he'll just tell them, well, this is nothing. You know, I'm just shining your shoes. Christ hung on a cross for you. And people get real quiet, and they'll let him shine the shoes. <laughs> so, oh, wonderful. You know, he'll try to shine at least three or four pair a week. But a highlight for his week as well. Yeah. Oh, you better believe it. And we talk about it all week long. We pray over it all week long. Um, yep. This is one of the things that we're saying as you get involved in spreading God's kingdom, yep. he then turns around and gives you joy. Oh, every time. And for the people who are not involved in doing what God wants done on a global scale or in any kind of a scale, local scale of ministering and serving, right. they're missing out on so much joy. Oh, yeah. And the joy that they have is weak. Yeah, and very fleeting. Very fleeting. Um, you know what's really something is that I can prove that that is true, and it's just not my testimony, but like everybody that's been working there at the dental clinic for the past, um, it'll soon be six years that we've been in operation, but good five and a half, um, we probably have 90% of the same volunteers that we started with at the very beginning that we have right now. And the only ones that have left are people that have actually moved. Wow. I mean. That speaks volumes. It, it does, because they know that they're gonna walk away from there thinking, Lord, you had your way in my life tonight. Now I may mess up the rest of the week, <laughs> but tonight <laughs> you are glorified. And that's the truth. This story that we were sharing today about the prostitute, that was over a year and a half ago, but the joy is still there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you've got probably a hundred more stories you oh, can talk about. Lands. It goes on and on and on. So yeah, and it just continues every single week. And we say that God does a miracle every week. We'll end up getting to see a couple of emergency patients that the emergency room will send us. And um, it's a miracle every week when you, people come in, they're in so much pain. Even if we can't give them painkillers, we can pray. 
and we can put them on an antibiotic and uh, tell them how to take Advil. <laughs> and um, yeah. there's so much joy. There's so much joy.